Hoy tenemos el privilegio en conversaciones en La Nación de contar con la presencia de una de las mayores referentes en la conservación de la naturaleza y de los animales silvestres. La doctora Jane Goodall, que está de visita por pocos días en Buenos Aires. Hello. Very, we are very grateful that you came here, Dr. Goodall. Oh, thank you for inviting me. I know you didn't study to be a, a researcher in animals, but you are a doctor from many universities now. Yes, well, when I first went to Africa, I hadn't been to college at all. But then when I'd been studying the chimpanzees for two years, my mentor, Dr. Leakey, said that I would have to have a degree, I would have to get my own money when he wasn't around. And so he got me a, a place to do a PhD in animal behavior in Cambridge University. So I got the PhD without the prior degree. Okay, you, and how was your, when you came there to Africa, the difference between cultures and everything, how did you adapt there? You were very, very young. You were 23 years old. 23 when I first arrived and, well, I'd read so much about Africa. I'd thought about Africa, dreamed about Africa. So actually it wasn't difficult at all. I was almost like coming home, especially when I ultimately got to the forest. What was your first, did you, do you remember your first encounter with wild chimpanzees? Absolutely, they took one look and ran away. Yes. It took about three months before I could get even a little bit close. They'd never seen a white ape before, which is what I was, am. And nowadays, after your work and the work of many other people, the conservation of chimps is beginning to be very uh, important in our agenda. For example, some days ago, the NIH decided not to keep their own chimpanzees for research. What do you think about that? I have been fighting for that since 1987, when I first saw our closest relatives in five foot by five foot cages. And it's taken a long time. There were gradual improvements. And then with this new director of NIH, you know, I had a long talk with him. And as a result, he put together a committee and a little group that went round every single uh, test that NIH chimps were involved in. Not one was beneficial to human health. And therefore, the decision to first retire 300 of them they kept 50 in case they needed them, and then he decided they should go as well. Yes, and you, but you know, researchers are very worried. I have been in some meetings where they very fervently expressed their, their worries about not having chimps to, to test their treatments. Do you think it is not necessary? I believe from what I've heard from, you know, various people that it, it isn't necessary. I mean, if you take, okay, chimpanzees are so similar to us that we share 98.2 or 98.6 DNA, the structure of DNA, so they're that close. And yet uh, they respond differently, for example, to HIV. And they don't come down with the symptoms of HIV AIDS, even though they can be infected with the virus. So there's that much difference. And you know, there are so many new ways now which are making animal tests obsolete. But even there are some researchers who, who are studying the difference between uh, uh, the chimps brain and human brain. And so they, they need chimps to prove that. How would they do that? Well, first of all, they can <clears throat> look at the brains of, of humans and chimpanzees who died and secondly, they can do experimental um, tests of intelligence. That's okay. It's the invasive stuff that's wrong. Okay. And uh, well, did you you have one son? Did you share with him the your research in the wild? Did he was you take with, him with you. He he was almost born there. He, he yes. was with me, but not with the chimpanzees. Chimpanzees have been known to attack and eat children, so obviously I had to keep him completely separate from the chimpanzees. Um, he never developed any love for that sort of thing. His love is the ocean, and he's now designing and building boats, and he has three children, 
and I think the daughter might become involved in some kind of animal behavior. And being a mother and a grandmother, your life is very, very busy. How, how much do you travel around the world every year? 300 days, just about 300 days. And unfortunately, the world is too big. I mean, Latin America, we now have two full-blown Jane Goodall institutes here in Argentina. This was the first, and the second is Chile. And so we're gradually growing. And then our youth program is in 130, nearly 140 countries now. Oh. Yeah. Do you think young people are different and they will provide the proper care for nature and animals? Well, if if the next generations don't do a better job of looking after the natural world, then in a hundred years' time, I would not want to be on this planet. And as you know, the climate change, big climate change conference is coming up in Paris. Sure. And all around the world now, everywhere I go, people are saying, oh, the climate's different. People have acknowledged and accepted that climate change is actually with us. The ice is melting, sea levels are rising, and so we just have to change. We have to find a new way of doing things. And, uh, well, for example, in Africa, where wild chimps live, uh, there's a, such a big problem with the preservation of the populations. Uh, another uh, article some days ago uh, in, that was published before this very big meeting in Paris said that more or less half of the population of wild chimps and primates were right. at the brink of extinction. How c can we uh, manage poverty and the preservation of nature? Uh, there's kind of a whole lot of different issues wrapped up in this. You know, first of all, the reason that the, these um, primates are so endangered is because they live in forests and the forests are endangered. And, you know, the, the whole of the Amazon, for example, and Congo, the forests are just disappearing. And it's the forest that is sequestering the CO2. And as the forest is cut down, the CO2 is released and that's the main greenhouse gas that's causing climate change. So we're wrap it, wrapped up with the extinction of the primates is the destruction of the forest which leads to climate change. So that's one aspect. And then the poverty. It was when I flew over Gombe in 1991, Gombe and the surrounding areas. and. Gombe was part of a forest belt that stretched along the shore of Lake Tanganyika. It's that long lake up the middle of Africa. And when I looked down from the plain, there was this little island of forest that was Gombe, surrounded now by completely bare hills. And there were clearly more people living there than the land could support, too poor to buy food from elsewhere, overused, infertile farmland. And that's when it hit me. There's no way we can save the chimpanzees in this piece of forest while people are living in abject poverty. So the Jane Goodall Institute, JGI, uh, in, in Tanzania, we started a program called Take Care, or Takari, and that's improving the lives of the people in a very holistic way, starting as they suggested. We didn't go and impose anything. They wanted to grow more food which meant restoring fertility to the overused farmland without chemicals, couldn't afford them for one, uh, and, and also better health facilities, better education for their children. We worked with the Tanzanian government, and gradually as they came to trust us, we could introduce water projects, sanitation, and probably most important, microcredit programs, particularly for women, based on Mohammed Yunus's Grameen Bank. Uh, scholarships to keep girls in school. So now the people in the 12 villages trusted us and became our partners and set land aside around the little Gombe National Park where forests could be restored and to form a buffer between the chimps and the villages. And it's been so successful that we've now moved out into 52 villages and uh, 
so it's saving huge area of land, uh, forest, protecting it. We have village forest monitors, volunteers who use uh, Google Earth donated tablets uh, to monitor the state of the forest that's either being restored as around Gombe or protected down in the south. So the people are, their lives are improving all the time. You came here with two uh, spokes animals. Who are they? Well, Cow is a very imaginative name, Cow there. She is my spokesperson for abused farm animals. And you know, it was the chimpanzees when I began to talk about their personality, their minds capable of solving problems, and above all, their emotions. When I got to Cambridge, I was told that I couldn't do that because only humans had personalities, problem-solving minds, and emotions. But the chimpanzees are so like us that gradually science came to accept that the difference between us and chimps is not, as was thought, one of kind, but of degree. And having broken this sharp line that was supposed to make us so different, which turns out not to be there at all, then you realize that the other animals also have personalities, minds. They can feel happiness and sadness. And when I think of the abuse of the intensively farmed animals, it is shocking because they're not objects just because they're raised to be eaten. And uh, cow also helps me to explain that huge areas of forest are being cut down to grow grain to feed the cows, the pigs, the chickens and so forth as more and more people eat more and more meat. And the other thing is food goes in one end, gas comes out the other, and that's methane. And that's an even more virulent greenhouse gas than, than CO2. You're a vegetarian, aren't you? I am a vegetarian. If I lived in one place, I'd be a vegan. <laughs> and the other one? That's Mr. H. Mr. H was given to me by uh, a man who went blind when he was 21, decided to become a magician was told it was impossible if he was blind. He said, well, I'll try. Children don't know he's blind. And at the end, he'll tell them and say, you know, something might go wrong in your life, but don't give up. There's always a way forward. And he does scuba diving, cross country, skiing. He does skydiving. And uh, you can't see from the angle he's at, but he thought he was giving me a stuffed chimpanzee and I made him hold the tail because Mr. H has a tail, he's a monkey. And Gary said, never mind, take him where you go and you know my spirit's with you. So he symbolizes the indomitable human spirit. And I'm amazed because when we met some minutes ago, you remembered me. You, you may have met thousands of journalists. How do you manage to be in such a wonderful, uh, fit way? a wonderful fit way. I think I, you know, I just have to get on with things. You know, the older you get, I'm jolly nearly 82, which means at whatever point my death is, I'm getting closer to it all the time. You know, that you know that as we get older, this, don't know when it'll be, but, and so I've got so much more to do. I, it's necessary to raise awareness about what we're doing to the planet, and I care about children. I want to grow our youth program, which is preschool through university. And so I just have to not slow down, but do more and more and more. And I don't have time to think about, you know, people say, do you go to the gym? <laughs> do you meditate? I probably meditate in my own way, but. You know, the, these meetings about climate change, the the previous ones ha have been sort of frustrating. What are your expectations for this one in Paris? I don't know, I can only hope. I, I, certainly since the last one, there's been an increase of awareness. And one thing which could be used in our, our favor, when I say our favor, I mean people who want to, to control the emissions of CO2 and methane. And I was part of the climate march in New York last year and they expected 80,000 people. They got around 400,000. Why? Because of social media. So everybody was around me on the march. They were all using cell phones and 
and tapping out little messages and telling their friends to come and join. That's why it swelled the way it did. And that was happening in big cities around the world. It was the biggest gathering of people around a single issue in the history of the world. Okay, so we'll hope that this one will be different and the agreement between world leaders will, will show a sign uh, for, the, for the road we have to take to improve our care of nature. Yeah, but it's going to be us that does it. Sure. We are the ones who are going to push the politicians. That's the way it has to be. Okay, Dr. Goodor, thank you so, so much for your visit to, our, to this space where we talk about different subjects and especially about science and health. Thank you so much. Thank you.